Awesome. Okay. Welcome everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, have here um, to be hosting Jay Cameron Carter and Amy Hollywood. I'm going to introduce them very briefly um, and then pass things over to Professor Carter and then um, Professor Hollywood will respond. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jay Cameron Carter today. Carter is Professor of Religious Studies at Indiana University. His work is at the intersection of race and ecology and draws on the resources of Black critical theory, continental philosophy, feminist, gender, and queer theory, as well as literature and poetry of the African diaspora. He's the author of Race, a Theological Account, Oxford, 2008, the editor of the 2013 special issue of South Atlantic Quarterly on Religion and the Future of Blackness, and has recently completed another manuscript on white supremacy as a planetary structure and practice of political theology. Finally, he's finishing up a third manuscript, re-examining the concept of the sacred. Carter's work is both ambitious and innovative. It mines resources from the ancient to the modern, from the philosophical to the poetic. It asks the most important questions of our moments and breaks the boundaries of genre convention to speak in a bold voice about the radical possibilities of reconceiving the sacred. It's always a pleasure to welcome back Amy Hollywood, an alum of the University of Chicago Divinity School to Swift Hall, even if only virtually. Hollywood is the author of three books, The Soul is Virgin Wife, MacDillard of Magdeburg, Marguerite Perret and Meister Eckhart, University of Notre Dame Press, 1995, which received the Otto Grindler Prize for the best book in medieval studies, Sensible Ecstasy, Mysticism, Sexual Difference and the Demands of History, University of Chicago Press, uh, 2002, and Acute Melancholia and Other Essays, Columbia University Press in 2016. She's also recently completed work on a fourth book co-authored with Constant Fury and myself entitled Devotion, Three Inquiries in Religion, Literature, and Political Imagination, and is at work on a fifth entitled Secular Death, Haunting Henry James. Hollywood scholarship manages to be both lucid and complex, engrossing and sophisticated, powerful and precise. It moves fluidly across the fields of theology, philosophy of religion, medieval mysticism, literary study, and contemporary poetics, and thus has been deeply influential for scholars in multiple fields, not only within religious studies, but in medieval studies, comparative literature, and English. She's also the most generous of teachers and colleagues. So I'm going to hand things over to Professor Carter. Um, we're looking forward to hearing your paper. The, the paper is entitled The Matter of Myth, Charles Long and Black Feminism, and Professor Hollywood will be responding. Fantastic. So thank you, um, uh, Sarah, for uh, introducing me. And thank you as well, Amy, for being willing to hear me ramble a bit as I try and um, make my way through uh, this stuff that I'm very much um, trying to understand. Um, and so I'm writing in a mode of trying to explore. And so, and thank you finally to every one of you who, um, who are, are here and I truly look forward to the feedback um, that uh, I know that we'll get from you and that'll be great feedback um, given the topic um, that um, uh, Sarah's telling me that you all have been talking through. So with that said, I'm gonna read some of this. Um, some of this is in shambles, so I'll summarize some of it and we'll make our way through. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this talk is called um, The Matter of Myth, Charles Long and Black Feminism. And um, you can't see it here, but as I've written it, but the way that I've written the word matter um, actually matters. Um, I've written it as um, uh, M-A-T, and then the next T is in parentheses, E-R. So I'm playing off of matter and mater, um, the Latinate word um, by uh, often translated as, uh, as mother. It becomes this root term for um, the maternal. Um, I also um, extend the term into the M-A-T-E-R of materiality. So I'm playing with um, and trying to inflect um, those multiple registers of, of mater um, in relationship to matter. So the, mat the mater or the matter of myth, um, Charles Long um, and Black feminism. And then I have a a, a few um, um, epigraphs, whether they will remain epigraphs in the final version of this remains to be seen, but I still <laughs> think they're <laughs> heuristically useful. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read those, um, those um, uh, there are four of them and they're kind of hooks. So if, if, if I start to ramble and I start to <laughs> lose the thread at any point, just hold on to these, these epigraphs and they may become an anchor uh, for us. Um, the first is from Charles Long himself. Um, and, and that epigraph um, comes from his um, first published work, Alpha, The Myths of Creation. And the, the um, quotation goes as follows, uh, the word and content of myth 
are revelations of power. The word and content of myth are revelations of power. Uh, the second um, um, epigraph um, quotation is also from Charles Long um, from an essay contained in um, his final collection, Ellipses, um, the collected works of Charles Long. There's an essay in it called Matter and Spirit, a reorientation. And he has this statement in that essay, um, whether we are talking about ecology, gender, or ethnicity, the issue of matter is to the four, uh, quote unquote. <clears throat> okay, after these two Charles Long quotes, I have um, um, two quotations from um, Black feminist theorists. Um, the first one is from um, Hortense Spillers and um, uh, comes from um, an essay, an early essay of hers, I think it's like 1978. It's collected in black, white, and in color. Um, and it's um, her essay on Ralph Ellison. I think the essay is called Ellison's Usable Past. And the subtitle is Toward a Theory of Myth. Um, I'm sort of on this hobby horse. I think that this is a, a deeply underexplored dimension of, of Spillers' thought and work, and it, it begs for inquiry. And I hope that, you know, even if I don't give it the full inquiry that it deserves, I, ho I hope to incite and provoke um, um, inquiry around Spillers in this regard. But anyway, here, here's the quotation at the towards the end um, of, of the essay. Um, if we identify Sula as a counter mythology, Actually, this isn't from her Al Ralph Ellison essay. This is from another essay. But anyway, the quote works. Um, if we identify Sula um, as a counter mythology, we are saying that she is no longer bound by a rigid pattern of predictions, predilections, and anticipations. This is her, um, uh, Spillers' word is outlawry. This is her outlawry. Um, that she has the will toward rebellion itself is the stunning idea. Okay, end of that quote. And then finally, this last quote comes from um, a recent work by um, Zakia Imam Jackson. Um, the book is, because, is called Becoming Human, which is a really stunning piece of work. Um, she has a line um, in, 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 I believe this comes from chapter two of that text um, in which excuse me, Jackson says the following, uh, the black female, parentheses maternal, the black female maternal appears, if she appears, she appears as the work and the revelation of myth, as the work and the revelation of myth, end quote. And um, so let me read a little bit and I'll summarize a little bit all, along the way and I wanna um, keep a steady eye on, um, on, on the time here. Um, I write as follows. Um, while what I offer and what follows is a meditation uh, on the significance of the work of recently um, deceased historian of religion and theorists of black religion, and I might also add a distinguished alum uh, of the University of Chicago, Charles Long, um, I, I aim towards something more. I propose to think with and through um, a series of resonances that obtain between Long's thought and work, um, and work being done in critical Black philosophy, and more specifically, <coughs> excuse me, in Black feminist uh, theorizing. I explore these resonances at the foci of uh, the question, the problem, and even the status uh, of matter and myth under um, conditions of racial capitalism. In exploring these resonances, uh, my aim is not merely to note, note them as resonances, but to register, uh, register through them how questions of religious studies uh, are already internal uh, to Black studies and how Black studies offers alternative uh, directions uh, in the critical study of religion and indeed um, for raising a new and a fresh uh, a question that was dear to Charles Long himself, uh, namely, what is religion? Uh, put differently, um, I'm interested, <coughs> excuse me, in how Black study is always already what I like to call, um, and this is a, a, a kind of concept in the formulation I'm trying to develop, what I'd like to call Black religious study. Um, the religious uh, between these two words is in a parenthesis. So 
graphically, it matters how I'm writing this. I'm getting ready to elaborate why I'm doing this. Um, how, I'm, I'm, to read the sentence again, put differently, I'm interested in how Black study is always already what I'd like to call Black uh, religious, parentheses, uh, study. Uh, before saying a bit more about um, how I would like to proceed in exploring the convergences and the resonances between Charles Long's thought and Black feminist uh, philosophizing, uh, it is worth offering a comment or two about this formulation, Black religious study. In graphically positioning uh, the word religion or the religious in this way, uh, that is by holding it in a kind of suspension or um, making it kind of parenthesized uh, between uh, the word black and study such that religion and the religious are as it were held or engulfed uh, within the fecundity uh, of the void between and of these very terms. I'm pointing to how the theory of blackness precisely as uh, the theory, uh, theory of a practice of the sociality given in broken connection that marks black sentience advances a, a critique of religion, uh, though that critique um, <laughs> emerges through what might be called, um, what might be thought of as a para-religious orientation, para-religious orientation. Para-religious um, and not just para-theological blackness. Um, I'm sort of talking back to myself. I did this essay where I, played with this idea of paratheological blackness. Now I'm trying to like play with this idea of para-religious blackness. Para-religious and not just, <coughs> excuse me, paratheological blackness um, points to blackness's critical relationship um, to religion as a category crucial to the apparatus of the making of this world through colonial conquest and enslavement. To speak of para-religious blackness is to consider how black performance counter signifies against and beyond being signified upon. Long's way of putting this comes to the fore in his insistence on how the violent intimacy that ensued from colonial contact and enslaving created a fundamental problem for thought, both for those um, doing the signifying, that is, the, um, those, those, both for those who are signified upon, that is the colonized, the enslaved, etc., and those doing the signifying, those involved in the cultures of conquest. Um, indeed, let me try a right, right, okay, great. <clears throat> indeed, <coughs> excuse me, um, he argues that the violent intimacy of contact that took place between colonizer and colonized between the so-called uh, primitive and the equally so-called civilized between master and enslaved occurred at the material and symbolic site of the fetish, which European traders would identify as a religious symbol or object. This was set in motion a tradition of discourse that would include um, Europe's philosophers, its anthropologists, linguists, and the like uh, about the fetish in modernity. <clears throat> uh, the discourse about the fetish, again, as Long would constantly return to for ongoing examination inspired by the work of scholars like William Peets, would eventually serve um, to um, identify a distinct area of study in the 19th century, um, a distinct area of the study that would generate um, the study in the field of religious studies or the study of religion, um, though that field would take off through a consideration of the religions of primitive quote unquote peoples. I wanna re return to this idea of the fetish in my considerations of Long's thinking about matter and myth for the problem of the fetish from the beginning was haunting Long's early studies into myth. For now, I simply wish to make the point after long that in speaking of the objects used by various middlemen to trade in African flesh as fetish objects, the European traders rendered judgment on Africans' understanding of matter and sacrality. Their judgment 
was that it was deficient. That deficiency was a religious deficiency. I want to say that deficiency was a religious deficiency insofar as the fetish became a way of explaining why Africans valued objects. You might almost say overvalued objects and valued them differently than the European mercantilists who were developing a notion of material value based purely on objective criteria or what they called objective criteria, that is use value. More specifically, the explanation was that Africans were superstitious, lacking in reason, and consequently could not determine the proper value of material objects. Africans uh, simply fail to realize, so this reasoning goes, that material objects are just that and only that, <laughs> material objects, nothing more. The incommensurability between the emerging European mercantilist system of value predicated as it was on an imagination of the fundamental, shall we say, emptiness of matter or matter, uh, the ability of matter to be abstracted from, the abstractability from matter or of matter and the approach to matter evinced by African traders in which a material object or trinket deemed by the European merchants as of little value or no value could bear some divine or supernatural quality would converge to create a new kind of object, namely the commodity. And more specifically, in the case of what was happening off the coasts of West Africa, that commodity being the slave. A key point that long across the arc of his work from significations to the final work Ellipses um, is trying to address is that the violence at issue <coughs> excuse me, in the cultural context of conquest and enslaving is that, um, uh, is that this must all be understood as a religious event, an event of having been religionized, if I might uh, coin this word, um, having been religionized, um, that remains for us. It is this event, the religious event of having been religionized that remains for us, Long says, to come to terms with both as a situation of violent creativity and destruction, and also as an event that hosts uncontrollable and unpredictably deviant mutations or mutant deviations. Um, this is a very important point that I'm trying to get at here. The, the ambivalence of the um, notion of the religious, um, is that what I'm trying to like capture in this sentence here following long. On the one hand, um, the notion of the religious emerges as a way to embed um, the African um, inside of a kind of system of value um, that the um, merchants are enacting. And therefore um, religion as ascribed to the African and an inferior religion at that is a part of the structures of domination. And yet at the same time, Long is arguing and wants to argue that at the scene of the imposition of religion as a means and a mechanism of control and domination and as a vehicle through which value is produced, let alone extracted in order to produce a certain kind of value, there are these deviations that are still kind of like resonant or hosted in that very category that in a certain sense destabilizes that category. And Long wants to think them both at the same time. Now, in effect, what I'm going to argue is that the notion of black religion is right at the side, it, it occupies that deviance. It, it both um, bears the possibility of reinscribing um, positions of domination. And at the same time, it also hosts these possibilities of deviance and mutation. Um, mm -hmm. So just to elaborate on that point, um, those deviations to continue along this line signal alternative imaginations of matter. Um, and they have everything to do with what we might call the blackness of blackness. And here I invoke Ralph Ellison's underground sermonizing protagonist. It has everything to do with, shall we say, the blackness or what Long will call the opacity and the opugnancy 
We might even go a step further and say the Africanity of black religion. We're in out of that opacity and opugnancy, out of that Africanity, a counter creation through the void and in the wake of middle passage occurs. Period, okay. Um, all right, um, I'm tempted to elaborate, but let me just read another sentence or two and then I might elaborate. Um, in being religionized, which is to say in being subjected to the category of religion, in, in, in observing this, Long also states, and this is a quote, religion became the locus for a meaning that carried an archaic form. And this goes back to what I was saying um, earlier. Um, the reason why the category is inherently unstable, just like capital is inherently unstable, just like the production of the commodity is inherently unstable, is because in the production of that commodity, of that, uh, of that um, category and concept in order to enact domination, um, a, a kind of archaic form is still carried along inside of it. Um, it was a root meaning and thus could become the basis for a radical critical thought, quote unquote. It is from this insight that I wanna read long as a theorist within the black radical tradition from the site of the production of the category of religion and its internal instabilities, which set loose um, archaic and mutant deviations. This opacity, which marks, and again, I quote long, the religion of Afro-Americans is the source of new modes of thought where religion here is not to be understood merely in the conventional sense as that which takes place in organized established religion, but rather as indexing and signaling new orientations in the world. Um, among Long's many contributions then is precisely this unconventional understanding of religion. Regarding, the, um, regarding that unconventional understanding, uh, Long says, let me get my quote. Uh, yeah, regarding that unconventional understanding, Long says, quote unquote, for, for my purposes, religion will mean orientation. Orientation in the ultimate sense. That is how one comes to terms with the ultimate significance of one's place in the world. Long goes on from here to note that while the Christian form of religion as taken up by black folks um, is one site for the expression of these alternative orientations, <clears throat> he is quick to note and to stress that the Christian form of the enactment of alternative orientations in the world, that is religion, is not the only form. He goes on to say, indeed, that um, alternative um, expressions in style and expression in experience often carry at aesthetic sites through novels, um, art objects, aesthetic art objects. These two become carriers of an alternative orientation in the world, often in tension with the Christian church's expression among black folks of an orientation, um, um, an alternative orientation in the world. Okay. Um, this will lead long finally, and I'm thinking through the, intro, the important introduction to the work significations. This will lead long ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, to um, give attention to again, to the um, work that he's doing as a theorist of religion, which he calls archaic work, by which he means trying to reach back to archa archaic structures that carry through precisely in the production of the Negro in the production of the commodity form. And what Long means by um, archaism, he does signal um, um, the ways in which uh, he appreciates the work of Jacques Derrida on deconstruction, but he's also wanting to be clear about while there's a resemblance in what he's saying with Derrida, um, that he wants to lay out precisely what he's talking about. When he talks about um, the archaic forms, he is um, trying to um, um, enact a form of religious practice that invites us to now critically theorize the situation of violent, con violent contact and to use his language to crawl back through that experience to approach 
not fully tap into, not own in a new way, but to begin to approach, right, the archaic forms of a kind of otherness internal to Black life. For him, the work of Black religious theorizing, which I would argue again is the work of Black theorizing, is this kind of work of what I'm calling a kind of para-religious meditation on Black existence in the world. Okay, now with that said, I mean, in some sense I gave you much of my reading of Long, but with that said, I think I'm now in a position, um, I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff and move forward here. Yeah, I'm gonna read from here now. Okay, great. With that said, I'm now in a position to come back to the gamble, the big gamble of this meditation. The gamble of this meditation in part is to clarify the force of Long's thought on these matters by bringing his thinking into conversation uh, with black radical critical theorizing and particularly with aspects of black feminist uh, theorizing. Um, to drive home, my intention here is to drive home the claim I've made around Long and its, state, and its stakes um, by venturing in the direction of thinking what Long has said in resonance with considerations of matter and myth as they emerge, particularly through two um, thinkers that I have been um, um, quite given to the thinking with. The first is Denise Ferreira da Silva, um, and the second um, is the work of the emerging um, um, scholar doing some really vital and important work, uh, Zakia Imam Jackson. I'm particularly taken with um, Ferreira da Silva's and Jackson's meditations on matter precisely as mater or the matter in the mater of myth itself and how their thinking comports with and even in its own way extends um, Long's meditations on matter and myth. Hence, I want to think with um, Ferreira da Silva and Jackson so as to clarify the force of Long's thought while making a case for black religious studies um, in the way in which I talked about earlier or for black performance and its study as parenthetically or shall we say elliptically religious or more precisely para-religious. Okay, so what's my time looking like? Because <laughs> I haven't been watching my clock here, let me see. You've only been talking for 20 minutes, so you've got okay, great. Fantastic. So what I would like to do now is really just in many respects, because there's, there's too much here, I'm not gonna be able to read it all, <laughs> is I'm gonna give basically a kind of walkthrough of my engagement with Ferreira da Silva. And then I'm gonna give a walkthrough of my engagement with Imam um, Zakia, um, Zakia Imam Jackson. Um, and then I'll circle back <clears throat> to Long and think about um, um, how this, um, basically how in the process of what Jackson and Imam, uh, what Jackson and Ferreira da Silva are doing, we can sort of posit a kind of extension or a kind of carrying forward to its conclusion as it were of what Long's work um, is all about. Um, we know um, from um, starting with um, Denise Ferreira da Silva, her work begins um, with um, an extended meditation on the global idea, what she calls the global uh, idea of race. Um, this is an effort on uh, Ferreira da Silva's part to think the distinct um, spatiality on the one hand and the distinct uh, temporality on the other of um, the production um, of um, racial, the racial imagination, and more specifically, the production of the figure of what she calls uh, the affectable subject. By affectability, um, she means by this, the production of um, a figure in the world, um, racialized figure in the, in the world, um, who is marked not by self-determination, marked not so much by the, co the, um, the control of reason, but is overdetermined by being affected from the outside. The, um, the, the, the affectable subject is positioned over against and becomes a kind of vehicle through which to articulate what we might call the white subject or the subject that, that um, imagines itself and, and indeed, she's going to insist, imagines himself, because this is a kind of phallic subject, imagines himself as sovereign with respect to himself, sovereign um, with respect to himself by way of reason, um, and not being affected by the outside. Um, Silva wants to go on to note that um, the um, positioning of one as affectable over against one who is non-affectable or marked by reason 
is part it's part of the ways in which um, a global spatial arrangement is um, um, set in, is set in place. Um, the effectables are geographically situated in various parts of the world. The, um, the, the, those who are not affected, those who are marked by reason, Ferreira to Silva says, become those who are marked by the Enlightenment, those who are positioned <laughs> in, the, in Europe and in um, Euro -North, um, no the, the Euro-North Atlantic, um, the Western world. But Silva also is keen to note, and it's important in what she's saying here, is that the truth of the matter is, is that the entirety of what's going on in contact, the situation of contact, is that everybody is being affected. There is no non-affected position. Um, the, 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 the positing of the European subject as not affectable, as being self-determined, as being inner determined, determined by reason and not by a position or that which affects it from the outside is a position from repression. Um, moreover, Silva is interested in clarifying that that position of so-called non-affectability, which is really its own position of affectability and being affected by the very people that are being colonized, um, is uh, um, um, an activity that happens by way of matter. It's a particular kind of imagination of matter. Th this claim about the imagination of matter in um, the book um, "Global I Towards a Global Idea of Race is kind of buried inside of it. My contention is that in the essays that Silva has been writing since the publication of Toward a Global Idea of Race is truly starting to bring out the notions of affectability in relationship to matter. Um, indeed, um, Silva claims in one of her important essays um, it's got a long title. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to read it. It's a mathematical equation, and then it's got a subtitle. The subtitle really tells the point. The main title is um, life divided by blackness, or one divided by zero, is equal to infinity minus infinity, or infinity divided by infinity. The subtitle tells the point she's going after on matter beyond the equation of value. This essay is crucially important, as well as her essay, Hacking the Subject, another recent essay of hers in which she theorizes um, the production of the idea, the production of the figure of the European subject, the self-determined subject. Across these two essays, what Silva is at pains to, um, um, to note is that um, at stake in the um, production of um, a, a world in which total value has been violently taken from the colonized, in the form of enslavement, in the form of settler colonial theft of land, the theft of land, the theft of life, is that that theft is predicated upon an imagination of matter in which matter is evacuated of value. That evacuation for Silva is itself a kind of symbolic um, a theft that moves in relationship to material theft. Um, by the time Silva is finished, <laughs> finished much of her work, and here one can think as well of her essay um, uh, uh, towards a black feminist poethics. Um, that, that essay um, is at pains also not to um, sort of um, recruit um, a vision of matter and value in abstraction and, um, and therefore a vision of self-determination for the racialized subject. Instead, what Silva does crucially is um, point us towards new imaginations of matter and therefore forms of matter that are not built, to built upon logics of property, um, theft of total value um, for the sake of now the transformation of value, the transformation of matter into simply use value. I hear in this analysis um, um, a kind of kindred spirit or resonance between what Long is trying to do and what Silva is trying to do. Long, as I just um, summarized, is also concerned with the way in which capitalism itself is predicated upon the imposition of a new imagination of matter. Um, matter abstracted from inherent meanings so that in that abstraction, in that kind of vacancy, um, use value can be, in, can be enacted or theft can occur, commodification can occur. Um, similarly, Silva is interested in thinking through the protocols um, by which 
matter becomes um, evacuated of forms of life that move in relationship to matter and instead becomes um, um, a kind of vacancy in which use value can be enacted, theft can occur. We find also that that's Denise Ferreira de Silva. So I've offered a basic summary of, of Silva's work. Um, Imam, uh, Zakia Imam Jackson in her very powerful work, um, Becoming Human, it recently came out, I think it came out in March, something along these lines. It's a very powerful text. Um, key to that text or a, a key site of that text that I find one of the deepest kind of um, um, places for a kind of staged interlocution between Charles Long and um, what Jackson is doing is in chapter two of her work. Um, um, I believe it's called The Sense of Things. At stake in chapter two of that work is an attempt to read the art object, the aesthetic object of a novel, particularly um, Malo Hopkinson's um, novel, Brown Girl in the Ring. Um, through her reading of this novel, um, Zakia Imam Jackson um, wants to give an analysis with people like Heidegger on the one hand and Hegel on the other in the background of the form of worlding that this novel is trying to disturb and give it both give an account of, disturb and interrupt. Um, she begins the chapter um, with an analysis of the Heideggerian notion of worlding um, and then connects um, the Heideggerian notion of worlding with uh, the general um, backstory of Hegel on, on worlding. By the time she walks us through um, this, this kind of analysis of um, um, the, the idea of the world, the, the, the word the, she often italicizes to highlight one world is configured as a singularity here or a totality. Two, that the totality is a violent totality. And three, that totality is a totality of incorporation. Um, that the production of the world also moves in relationship to um, a certain imagination of matter. But not just a certain imagination of matter um, is the world built upon. Jackson, um, you can hear like a kind of conversation going on with Jackson um, building on um, um, Ferrer de Silva. Um, uh, Jackson also wants to argue that the building of the world through the imposition of a kind of totalizing understanding and incorporative understanding of matter happens precisely through a violence against um, um, resident forms, um, kind of native forms of existence that are always already moving in relationship to um, various forms of life, other expressions of matter. That brutality by which the world is generated, um, she calls an imperial myth. Um, this phrase she turns to um, Edouard Glissant to help her kind of elaborate. She says that the imagination of matter that is imposed, the imagination that is imposed upon matter in order to conceive of a singular world is a, an imperial operation, but crucially for her and insistently for her following Nalo Hopkins, it is the performance of a myth. In my own language, I, I sort of um, uh, uh, kind of annotate Jackson to say, it's not just the performance of the myth of a myth, but it's a particular kind of myth. Myth as monomyth, the imposition of the one, we might say, an order of oneness or the imposition of the one. I call this a monomyth. Monomyth yields, shall we say, a kind of monopolitical order. It can, it also gets oftentimes um, grounding and sustenance through a kind of monotheistic perhaps understanding of sacrality and the sacred, right? It becomes monolinguistic, right? It is, it is often powered by a mono, um, mono language, right? A, mon, a, a, a kind of singular vision of language. Um, Jackson seizes upon the idea of myth and following Horton Spillers, Jackson insists with Spillers and with Nalo Hopkinson that the response to this is not to run from myth. It is to mythify against the myth. And in mythifying against the myth to thereby activate or reactivate, I'll use Charles Long's language, archaic forms of dwelling with the earth 
archaic forms of dwelling with matter. It's precisely at this point that interestingly and provocatively, <laughs> um, Jackson insists that we must re-engage the question of religion. And more specifically, she says, we must re-engage the question of African religion and the issue of the fetish. For she too sees, and I have, an, I should say by, uh, by, by side comment, I, I've had an, uh, a chance to speak with um, Jackson about, about this. Um, and I asked her, was she a reader of, of you know, stuff happening in critical religious studies and particularly um, the work of Charles Long and she had not. Um, and so it, it, it all the more is interesting. The resonances are all the more powerful. So I, I asked her as well about, you know, um, how she came to this understanding of the importance of African religion. And what she came, what she articulated to me, what she said to me is that she in effect in reading with Nalo Hopkinson, it was Hopkinson that really truly helped her understand what was at stake in these alternative um, practices of religiosity um, Hopkins's novel is situated between the Caribbean and Toronto, right? And so you have these expressions of spirit possession, um, these, um, these, um, these forms and um, kind of descriptions of being caught up in, um, in the spirit and how in being caught up in the spirit, um, um, the, the, those who are um, enraptured in this way um, are, um, dwell on a different plane of existence, where the different plane of existence is not so much an existence, a different plane that is out there somewhere, but the different plane of existence is an alternative dwelling with matter and with the earth itself. And so her, her language is, there's a different activation of matter that's at stake here. And uh, Jackson goes so far as to say that it's precisely at that moment that this different activation of matter is a different practice of myth itself. Um, I, I find this um, absolutely fascinating and important, but there's one final thing that Jackson puts on the table and, and, and makes quite explicit. It's also there um, for Pereira da Silva, but I just found it absolutely captivating the way um, Zakia and mom Jackson um, has put this. Jackson is keen to observe that imperialism, colonialism, enslavement, the production of, uh, of the Negro is in effect the black, what she calls the blackening of matter. And then she goes so far as to say, it's not just the blackening of matter, but it's the blackening of mater, M-A-T-E-R. This is important for Jackson for it's precisely in, um, through the non-representability of black mater, which often then gets figuralized in black woman. Black woman becomes a figure of non-representable black mater, um, forms of um, existence, forms of material life that are not reducible to capitalist commodified racially gendered sexuation that she wants to turn her attention to in order to speak of the non-representable forms of ma matter as mater, one must return to discourses of myth, but not as monomyth, but rather myth here as a kind of multiplicity. <laughs> myth here is a kind of um, um, a, a plurality. Myth here as a, a, a kind of fecundity that exceeds representation. The imposition of uh, capitalist forms of imagination on top of mater, on top of matter, um, is the result of a kind of, um, how does she put it? She puts it as a kind of sexuating violence and engendering violence against matter. It is to render mat matter penetrable and thereby ownable. That penetrability as ownability Jackson articulates as a form of sexuation and engendering. This she summarizes under the term mater, the blackening of matter as black mater. What Jackson argues is that it's at the scene beginning of black religion, religion as deficient, that you're beginning to see this, this kind of violent 
this penetrated violence against, against matter. This kind of sexuating and engendering violence against matter that culminates in the production of the slave where, shall we say, the or figure of the slave becomes the figural black woman insofar as she's not just the commodity, she's the commodity that reproduces more commodity. It's at that point that we sort of see that the violence against matter is a violence against black mater, where black mater is surely related to the figural black woman, but the, it's not reducible simply to the figural black woman. The figural black woman becomes a site from which to think the non-representability that is carried archaically, shall we say, in the symbol of black woman. Now, I think at this point, um, at least I want to propose that we're at a place where we can come back to Long. Long's interest in the violence against matter through the imposition of um, violent imaginations upon matter. Long's um, attunement and interest in thinking the archaic forms that are carried non-representationally non as a kind of like a, opaque um, archaic forms carried in the category of religion, but that's not reducible to that category. I wanna suggest is uh, resonates with what I've just articulated around Zakia Imam Jackson's work, as well as Ferreira de Silva's work in trying to think in Ferreira de Silva's case, the infinity of matter, which Ferreira de Silva says is also um, marked and hosted by um, the, uh, the, the black feminist form and can be thought and articulated as a kind of black feminist poetics. And it resonates with what I've just summarized around Zakia Imam Jackson's work in her meditations on Brown Girl in the Ring. I hope that <laughs> what I've begin, I begun to make a case for is how this type of black critical philosophizing, black feminist theorization has internal to it, a meditation and a critical reflection on the religious vis-a-vis -vis, um, the materiality of the symbol religion itself. And I've also hoped that I've shown here, or at least begun to intimate that there's another horizon and trajectory for the critical study of religion that a person like Charles Long has surely lifted off the, off the ground but yet, when we think long with the kind of black feminist theorizing that I've summarized here, we, we can extend long um, to say that his meditations on religion are as such meditations on the, the violent sexuation and engendering of matter. And at the same time, he points us toward, shall we say, queer modalities of non-representability hosted um, by matter and that can redirect what we even mean by religion. We might even say, I was, I was reading with a, um, a study group um, of grad students that I'm a part of this afternoon, and um, we are reading through um, Jose Munez's um, Cruising Utopia. And one of my grad students called to my attention a wonderful passage. <laughs> and um, after they pointed to um, this passage, uh, the student then said, um, Professor Carter, I think this is everything that you're talking about and how you're trying to think about Black feminist um, theorization um, with Charles um, Long's uh, work around the opaque, et cetera. So it's just one um, sentence. I'll read it and then I'll use that as, um, as my conclusion. Um, Munez is, interestingly, in one of the rare moments in the book, is actually talking about myth. Um, He's talking about mythical, uh, mythological cultural heroes, and he's thinking with Marcuse. He gives this quote um, from Marcuse. I won't read the quote, but he comes out of the quote and he offers this powerful commentary. And I'll read it and conclude with this. Um, Munia says, the linkage of the Orphic, um, Orpheus um, to homosexuality and, nar and, and, and narcissism, narcissus, to non-procreative non -procreative sexuality, he says, aligns both mythopoetic categories with an aesthetic protocol that I will call queerness. He continues, in this instance, I am describing queerness as uh, the great refusal that Marcuse delineates, which is a refusal of what, once again, Marcuse calls the performance principle. I love that. And I suppose then what I'm suggesting 
is that Charles Long's theory of religion um, as a theory of black religion proposes black religion as well as blackness as non-performance, right? Of the terms of religiosity um, in the interest of what exceeds religion as such. And in, in many respects, that's precisely what I'm focusing in on. The link between the kind of black feminist theorization that I've summarized with Ferreira da Silva and Jackson and with the religious studies theorizing that I've summarized with Charles Long, I think converge on, um, uh, converge on the notion of a kind of non-performance, a performative non-performance. Okay, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you um, very much. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. That's fantastic. So, so much to think with. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jay, um, so much. And that's a lot. And I just have a, a couple little places where I'll insert some questions um, because I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about and a lot uh, to take in. Um, The thing that initially strikes me most powerfully, um, I can't do I can't do the summation of all the things that I think are great about what you just said because it's too like it's too it's too close. So um, so let me let me just point out uh, pull out a few things that I think are are really important that I would like to hear more about and and might connect to the class um, to Sarah's class and to what you guys have been doing. Um, okay, so 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 I do think that this it's really interesting the way fetishism operates here. Um, and the fetish as, uh, as, as founding to a certain way in which religion is theorized um, and uh, the recognition or not recognition, excuse me, the, the naming of the relegation of the fetish to the overvalued material object. I think one of the th points of ambivalence that you point to in Long as he talks about fetishism um, and that is internal to the very articulation of religion and fetishism um, is whether the fetish marks the site of religiosity or the site of its absolute outer boundary, the, the, the refusal, the limit, the thing that is not religious. So on the one hand, there's a claim of people of, of African descent being particularly religious because of certain sets of practices uh, and materialized modes of what is understood as spirit within a certain framework. And yet on the other hand, there's a claim of Africa, and this is in Hegel, as the place that has no religion precisely because of its immersion in putative immersion in materiality. So I think there's this fundamental uh, amb amb ambiguity, ambivalence, ambivalence is the right word, about whether when we're talking about fetishism, we're talking about religion or the polar opposite of religion. And that seems to be operative throughout what you're, um, what you're laying out across um, th these different, this critical black tradition and, and, and in Long's work. Um, and it makes it hard for me sometimes to think about what is happening with um, the language of the archaic and what we do or don't want to do with the language of our archaic. I hear the language of the archaic and I immediately go, ah, no, um, uh, because it feels like it is a relegation to the space outside of history, outside of the possibilities and parameters of change, outside of the possibility of new forms of signification. So when you talk, Jay, about long wanting religion to think about religion as orientation and as signaling new orientations in the world, the very art, very idea that religion is about sig the signaling of new orientations in the world seems to me at odds with the language of the archaic, um, which would on the surface at least seem to suggest, no, we're reorienting ourselves in relationship to old patterns of being in the world. And I think that's one of the tensions I see in some of the work in, in black studies, thinking about um, African diasporic religions and African religions about whether is this a return to an archaic past? Is this a overcoming of the rift generated by the Middle Passage and or never having been experienced as a rift of the Middle Passage, passage if we're talking about certain African uh, religions? Or is it uh, imagining of a new future coming out of a reimagined articulation of practices that are both tied to and, and ruptured from their, their source? And how do we talk about that both tied to and ruptured from? And this is one of the places where I think Long 
is wrong to separate himself from Derrida and he gets himself in trouble that he doesn't have to be in if he was a more, I would say this, and I can say this having known Charles Long a tiny bit, a more generous reader of Derrida. Um, you know, and I, and I get why he wasn't, but I'm also kind of like, come on, let's, let's, let's have that break and attachment. And if you can have both of those things, then we're gonna get to the new forms of signification uh, that, that I think are at the center of Long's work. I think that's absolutely right. Um, so that um, so that so that my worry is about how the archaic and the new fit together. Um, um, the other thing I would point to, this is a separate point, is what's fascinating to me about the language of fetishization as you talk about it in Long and as it's operative, you know, in European discourses as laid out by Peitz and others or Peitz and others. I don't even know how to say his name. Um, is that Marx and Freud both take that notion of the material as without value um, and the fetish as the thing that is in principle overvalued and turn it against their own European, European systems of thought, right? Um, so the claim in Marx is, no, the fetishists aren't the West Africans, the fetishists are the European uh, capitalists and you're the ones who are overvaluing, uh, you know, a, 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 a set of material objects that have no value. You're the ones who turn things into use value, exchange value. Um, and similarly, I think with Freud, I think Freud's notion of the fetish is one that takes what appears to be a set of claims about religion elsewhere and says, no, this is what Christianity is about. Christianity is about the overvaluation of the object um, and the rendering um, immaterial of materiality through the very act of violence done in relationship to colonialism, imperialism, um, both externally driven and internally driven. So it's an interesting uh, moment where, where the question of whether matter has value um, and the racialization of capital are being articulated, even if they're not explicitly said, in the very theorization of fetishism in both Marx and Freud. So I think it's there, even if they don't, well, Freud does think about it in terms of racial, in racialized terms, but, but Marx does not particularly. Um, um, but one can do that pretty easily because the, the turning of the claims about the fetish back onto the European is, is at the center of what they're, of what they're doing. Um, that's just a, in some ways, that's a side point that I thought might be interesting in relationship to the reading that people have done for the class. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say, um, I think, uh, and again, so, so there was my worry about how archaic and new fit together and are there ways to talk about the, the picking up of old modes of orientation in new ways that are transformative. I think that's possible, um, but, but the more the interest is in, in in, um, to use a bad word, fetishizing the originary or the archaic, the more problematic the move is. Um, so that's my anxiety. Um, I have a similar anxiety about the, the language of myth and the language of the myth as a site of unrepresentability. And, and here I can't really remember how Long talks about it. And I, and I don't know how it's being used in some contemporary discourses. Um, when I think about myth, I think about something that is hyper represented and representable. I don't think about it as operating in the realm of the unrepresentable at all. Um, and so, and maybe this is my own, you know, sort of European, you know, training and in, in, in religious studies and is getting in the way of my imagining it otherwise. But, um, and, and even when thinking about the figure of the black, um, uh, mater, I'm like, you could, is there something unrepresentable? There's a, something that is like, also all too often caricatured and represented and stereotyped. And, you know, and so I think about pieces in Spillers where she's talking about, it's not the invisibility of black women, or it's not only, let me rephrase that. It's not only the invisibility of black women, it's also their hyper visibility. Their, you know, the saturation of a public sphere with certain images of blackness, usually uh, uh, always sexualized in one way or another that are meant to elicit various kinds of negative affect um, in white people and and in black people also and in people of other races. So 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 on the one hand I'm totally with you as you know from previous conversations on the question of how we can think about that which exceeds 
the, the, the representation, that which exceeds visibility, that which exceeds um, uh, uh, the capacity for language um, to, to name it. Um, and something that undoes, that both orients us and undoes our orientation, that disorients us at the same time, and religion is occupying both of those sites. On the one hand, I'm totally, totally with you on that, but I'm still anxious about myth as the term through which that occurs. Um, I think saying monomyth as opposed to a multiplicity of myths helps, but I'm still not sure that it can get at the unrepresentable um, in the ways that that you're that you're that you're after, um, or that I understand you. I might be misunderstanding you, Jay, but the way I understand you is being after. Um, and so that raises the question: Okay, well, what other vocab? Is there another vocabulary that could be useful, or is there a way of really re reimagining what myth is that would um, that would not fall victim to the dangers of overvisibility of um, of being named, cornered, commodified, um, that seems to me to be one characteristic of how myth operates within the terms of, of, of late capitalism. So, 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 so those are two of, the, two of the points where what you're discussing is incredibly energizing and, and, um, and opening up of ways that we can think about our relate how we dwell on the earth, you know, in in ways other than through the devaluation of the earth and outside of the logics of a racialized capitalism. Absolutely, but I worry about talking about it in the terms of myth, in the sense that is it possible for myth to escape that logic of devaluation that has been so crucial to its operation within? Uh, broadly white Western European imaginary. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Jay, did you want to take a couple minutes to respond? Um, <laughs> wow, I mean, I just sort of want to take a few minutes to keep taking it in. <laughs> um, because um, yeah. <laughs> I have been, this is, that was, thank you, Amy, so, so much, you know. That's why I love being on like a, a panel with you because I always walk away as like, man, does this really work? <laughs> um, but thank you so much for this this engagement. Uh, um, let me uh, let me re briefly respond to a couple of the points. The one I'm going to respond least to because I think it's the one that is it, it just helps me further my point, and that is the uh, the observation that you make about Marx and Freud. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, and um, I think that just that like kind of just dovetails into sort of what I'm saying that the fetish, the, the notion of the fetish is itself a European production, right? That is then exported as it were onto the African and in that exportation kind of represses the fact that the fetishistic operation is actually happening through the Europeans, right? And that, that's the kind of unstable, incoherent groundwork of, um, capitalist production or um, the, the idea of the world, right? Um, so I think that's, I, I mean, I love that. And um, yeah, I, I would love to maybe a, a, some a side note, just get some places I can go to in Marx and Freud and just trying to begin to dabble in that a little bit and just see how they, how they work that out. Because I think, you know, your summary is just spot on in that regard. Um, the second thing I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly respond to, or at least try and think with a little bit, because I think it's an important question, and that is how the archaic and the new fit together. And I also took that to be a question of, um, is the in what sense is the archaic itself, for lack of a better term, historical? Um, is it is it is it to some sort of abstraction, right? And in there, and in, and if so, as an abstraction, does it reproduce some of the very problems? that we're actually trying to kind of like think our way through and out of. Um, I, I'll only go with the way in which I read long. Um, I take it that, I mean, it's that, it's that comment that he says, um, I don't know where my copy is, it's around here somewhere. It's that comment that Long, oh, here it is. Um, long says on the kind of like page nine of significations, which I think is just like this 
this quite rich um, statement. Um, we're at the at the, at the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, Long says, the religious experience forces us to come to terms with these modalities, affirmative and critical. My project of the, on the critical level is a form of archaic critique, um, if you will, or if you will, a kind of crawling back through the history that evoked these experiences. Um, in other words, for the sake of thought, Blacks must now freely accept for themselves that which in a previous history they were forced to undergo. This critical recursus is a vital resource for critical thinking. Um, and then he's, and he says, um, I'm tempted, I, I'm attracted to Derrida's deconstruction because it seems to be a philosophical mode akin to what I'm calling a crawling back through one's history. And then he says, the languages and experiences of signification can be seen for what they are and were. And one might also be able to see a new and counter creative signification and expressive deployment of new meanings expressed in styles and rhythms of dissimulation. The religious experience is the locus of this resource. Um, I sort of read that quite, I read that paragraph as long, not trying to um, posit the archaic as an abstraction, but as um, an alternative historical residue inside of the his history of violence. Um, and that, that alternative historical residue inside of the history of conquest and the, vi the violence of enslavement, et cetera, et cetera, is truly an alternative history that at any point can be, shall we say, lived into, activated, and um, um, inaugurate alternative directions of temporality or something like this. It's almost like at that point, I want to like almost like read that moment through Munez's queer temporality, right? Queer temporalities are, um, um, are identifiable, notwithstanding that they're utopic horizons, they're identifiable inside of the history or in relationship to the history of straight time, even as they're not reducible to the histories of straight temporality. I almost want to read the archaic like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if, it, if, if that stands, if, if, if one can pull that off, <laughs> if I can pull a, such a reading off, I wonder if that does respond to the problem of, uh, of reading the archaic in, in, the, in the rightly problematic ways that you've identified if that's what he's doing. Um, and if it is what he's doing, I might need to you know, announce a clear kind of break from what I'm doing at that point, because yeah. my own proclivities theoretically are to go in the direction I just summarized. And, and just quickly, I, I think that's, I think what you're describing is right. And I realized that what I was in part responding to in your paper was not something you were saying, but it was some other things that I had been reading in which people have seemed to want to posit a much closer, a, a much more immediate reactivation of the archaic yeah. or the other. And, and that's what makes me nervous, but it's not what you're doing. Yeah, and, and I think Long himself, like on page six of the of, of that introduction as well, Long um, <laughs> articulates three potential ways in which the, the 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 oppressed, the violated, can respond to this situation. One of which he says is um, he says on the one hand, some of these protests demand a continuity of the Western ideals in dealing with them. To some extent, some of these protest movements see a certain normativeness in Western values and are surprised that the uh, Western investigators were not able to discover the primordial structures of these values in their own cultures. He, then he says, in other cases, the protest represents disavowal of all that is associated with the West and idealizes the authenticity of their cultures prior to the context situation. And he, he's gonna say, that's not the move either. And I think that's the kind of archaic you were saying, this is a problem. He's, his, his, where he breaks is he says, in still other cases, the attempt is made to come to terms with the contact situation itself as a new form of human creativity. And I think it's the moment of what I call deviant creativities or kind of mutant formations right inside of the violent creation that happened. Like um, the production of the slave as a commodity is this like kind of fucked up violent creative act. And yet right in that kind of like fucked up situation, there's like these mutant forms of creativity that kind of deviate and go astray. Mm 
And I take it that what he means by the archaic is he's trying to think those mutant deviations and potentialities. And in trying to think black religion as precisely the, med and I, I wanna extend it and say the meditation on blackness as a meditation on black religion is a meditation on these mutant kind of deviant, you know, non-teleological um, forms of creativity and potentialities. Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes the object of black religion, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the, the, the last point that you made um, is the one I really, I go back and forth on, I, I truly need to continue to think about because you pressed me in all of the right ways. Does this language of myth really, can, can it, does it do the work that I'm trying to recruit it into service of doing? Um, I go back and forth. Um, <laughs> I'm still sort of at the place of yes with serious qualifications and the qualifications I take from Spillers on the one hand and from actually the poet Nathaniel Mackey on the other. Mm -hmm. um, Spillers, um, even in the quote that I gave at the, at the beginning, Spillers does not alight upon the language of myth or mythology. She alights upon a language that she kind of poeticizes. She calls it the counter myth. Right. That counter I think is like absolutely vital. And I read what she wants to accomplish with the counter. Um, is similar to what Nate Mackey is trying to accomplish when he speaks of, I actually have written on this a little bit, so I, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I'll be as lucid as, <laughs> as as long as I labored to write this, this thing that got published. But Mackey talks about um, what he says, um, he says that kind of black performance and black poetic practice and black poesis is right. what he calls not so much myth, but he says it's ism. He <laughs> says it's anagrammatical myth. It moves in relationship to myth, but disorders it. It's anagrammatically disordered myth. And so he takes the letters of myth and scrambles them basically and produces ithem. But the way he gets to ithem, he says that ithem is clipped rhythm. It's anagrammatical myth. And he says it's clipped rhythm. The RH of rhythm is clipped off. And he says that the styles, the aesthetic rhythmic kind of styles and modes of performance that is blackness is ithmic. <laughs> it moves against the violent a kind of freezing of black life into a kind of mythic denigrated image, right? Um, the mad black woman, right? Um, the, the black male rapist. It, it ithmicizes that myth kind of desedimenting it and setting it loose in these deviant directions. Mackey argues that poesis is the work of ism against modernist myth. Mm. In that way that I'm trying to like talk about what I call black mythographies and sometimes what I also write as black counter myth. Or when I'm talking about Mackey, I'll just call it ism. Mm -hmm. That's great. So much I actually want to say, but I also want to give the students a chance to ask a couple questions. I just want to say one brief thing just to frame what you're doing in relation to our course, which is just so exciting for all of us, is that I feel like what you've done here is you've given us a chance, and it's helpful for me in my own work, to think about Black cultural forms as forms that actually we have to understand within the story of the fetish and the story of the history of religion in such a way that 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 that, that we've get, we now have a continuity to a narrative and the continuity to the kind of counter mm -hmm. uh, counter performance and counter conduct um, that gives it such an important resonance for the study of religion, which I think. Mm -hmm. It's hugely powerful, and I think it must be powerful for the students who've been paying so close attention to the resonance of the story of, of how the colonial encounter with Africa has, has so many other resonances in the history of philosophy, psychoanalysis, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But I will turn things over. So, um, so if you have a question, I think the best thing to do is to raise your hand. We probably only have time for a couple, um, but I will take whatever, wherever I see a blue hand. Or if you have something in the chat, if it's easier to put something in the chat and have me um, just articulate it that way, that's fine too. Um, but the floor is open. Yeah, Anna. So I, I acknowledge that you have probably considered this, um, but perhaps you can explain if you already have why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about this problem that you were both just discussing about the myth not working and how it does work. Mm 
Um, and I wonder to what end death could possibly work. And, and I, I ask because I'm absolutely not as well read on this, but um, I'm thinking of how Tommy Curry um, talks about black bodies as in his The Man Not um, about mm -hmm. death kind of permeating black existence mm -hmm. um, in this ontological way, both in black existence and in white existence um, that makes it um, possible to be dominated because you can do whatever you want with this corpse essentially, um, mm -hmm. both culturally, but also materially, as you mm -hmm. say. Um, so I was wondering if you already consider death as kind of a medium for this mythology, um, kind of language that we're kind of skirting around. Mm -hmm. um, what works and what doesn't work about that medium? Hmm. Um, I need to, I need to, um, I need to sit with that maybe a little bit longer. I'll offer a response that I admit probably is not adequate. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I need to continue the process. And Curry's book is on my shelf. I need to get to it. So it's, it's there in the queue. Um, but I, I do think that the issue of death is like important here. And I'll think about it less so through Curry because I've not read Curry and think of it more so through Ferreira da Silva who's thought extensively about it. Um, Ferreira da Silva um, argues in the global idea of race that the affectable subject um, in his kind of like pristine expression in um, the figure of the black um, and she already intimates in that early text, the figure of the black woman um, is always positioned at the horizon of death. That's her language. Um, such that, and if we like bring it inside of the story of the fetish, the story of the fetish is the story of those who overvalue materiality and in that overvaluation didn't matter or something. Um, they're, they're, They've got a, like a deadened relationship to matter. It's, it's um, I don't know. I, I need to think about and find the language for it. But Ferreira da Silva, she, she does talk a lot about death and that the affectable subject is positioned at the horizon of death. Um, they're already in some respects dead, right? They're, they're, their aliveness is a dead aliveness or something. And for this reason, if, if you wanted to like, um, Denise wouldn't like this, but I'll, I'll just use it for the language. Um, uh, if you can want to think because the, because the black or the affectable subject is always at the horizon of death, that's why they magnetize bullets, right? That's a, um, th that's a Frank Wilderson formulation. <laughs> um, th th that's, that's exactly, um, exactly why. Um, and so this kind of parceling out of death and life or life and death such that life and death in their supposed opposition are actually a part of the apparatus of the building of a kind of um, a world imagined um, um, from the vantage point of reason and the non-affectable subject is all about death. Affectability is to be dead or the affect of affectability is death perhaps. So we have a question, oh, sorry. We have a question in the chat um, to ask, asking you just to, to be a little bit clearer about what it would mean to mythify against myth. Yeah, I, I think it's the last stuff um, that um, Amy and I were just talking about. It's it's this kind of idem thing, this kind of um, um, uh, the counter myth that Spillers would talk about. Um, I think that's what that's what mythify against myth. The actual language mythify against myth is itself actually it's it's Roland Bart, but I'm reading it through this this tradition. It, it, it's it's Bart's out of um, his essay on mythologies, so it is his language, but I'm consciously routing it in this direction. So we have, yes, Yeti, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. So yeah, I can, I'm interested in the, the black material. This, this is really like a powerful symbol which contains a archaic approach inside and which can dis destabilize or like threatening the reproduction of modernities or the reproduction of the modern myths as, as what you say. I'm interested in kind of the internal, if there's an, any internal relation be, between the black and the Matia or the black and the female. Because I think both, both uh, Africanity and femininity 
can serve as a archaic power or archaic this project. And when they put together, is it what can intensify what you say just about the, the ism or like the, the counter myth against the modern myth or um or is there is there any like internal mechanism we can kind of describe the it's the relation or like um their function uh you know uh, in, as opposite to like to see th these two as two separate um symbol yeah um it's a it's a great question <laughs> and i, I want to make sure I, I i got it right um you you asked the question about the 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 notion of black mater um and the feminine and is there a kind of uh, a kind of connection between the two is there some sort of mechanism by which they're they're work um by which they're working together by which perhaps they're even identified or something like that is that the nature of your question um i think i want to thinking with um particularly um zakia jackson i think i want to sort of offer a resounding yes to that I think like the one of the key interventions, I think both for it's in Ferrer de Silva, but I think that Jackson, you know, is just the latest in giving it this really deep and crisp philosophical articulation. Um, Jackson wants to argue that black mater is this kind of kind of feminizing of matter or something. Right. And, and therefore, racial capitalism or the production of the so-called non-affectable subject. Um, the enlightened subject, the, the subject of reason um, in the political sphere, um, the citizen su subject is necessarily a kind of, kind of patri, this is Denise's language, is a patriarch form. So black mater is a certain kind of form of the feminine, but both Jackson and um, Ferrer de Silva want to be very careful here because they don't want to collapse um, merely collapse the racialized black woman um, as black mater, right? She, it's, yes. it's a signal, it's a, it's, this is long, you can use long language here. She's a signifier of something, right? And when it comes to bl black masculinity, Spillers' language in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, at the very end in which she implores um, black, the black male, to reckon with the female within. This is a 1987 text. But if you put that text right next to Zakia Jackson's text, you can sort of say that by way of Jackson, what Spillers is imploring the black male to do is being poised and lured and seduced to desire, right? This is like the psychoanalytic register, to desire to become a man. That desire is in a kind of violence against Black Mater to not reckon with another form of existence and way of being in the world. That within the patriarch forms of racial capitalism gets necessarily denigrated as female and signified at its nadir around Black woman. Does, 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 that, does that make sense? And so, so I think that I would sort of like wholeheartedly like kind of affirm what you're saying, give an affirmative response, namely that um, black mater and the feminine um, are, are deeply bound together, right? And it becomes the precise challenge of um, the black male who, it, who has the, the desire to become patriarch held before him. <laughs> to actually dwell with the, with the female within. And, and, and in that sense, to enter into a kind of material existence, M-A-T-E-R, a material existence. Something along those lines is how I want to answer, uh, answer that question. Um, by way of public culture, to sort of see, <laughs> to sort of like give some sort of display of what I'm talking about. Think about the craziness that um, Ice Cube said with respect to Trump's. Think about the craziness that we've been seeing for a long time with respect to um, Kanye West. Or, or inside of hip hop, I'm teaching this course right now called Hip Hop Religion. And we've been talking about, um, um, we just finished this section on hip hop and identity and talking really intensely about gender 
and thinking intensely about um, hip hop masculinity and how hip hop masculinity is what I call a complex masculinity, ever poised between masculinity otherwise on the one hand and a kind of fallback into and an acceptance of or living into a, a, a kind of um, patriarchalism um, that is never not always neoliberal capitalist, blah, 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 to become a mogul. Right. And so I think that this is precisely what's at stake for Jackson and for Fer Ferrer de Silva and for, for, for my own predilections and theoretical um, orientations for me too. So it's, I know it's after time for class, but I also don't want to cut this conversation absolutely short. Um, Professor Dustar had a question and I want to give him a chance to ask it. There's also a question in the chat. So I'm going to read the question in the chat and then um, Alireza, then maybe you can give your question and, and um, Jay, you can decide how you want to answer them. Um, so, um, so this is Charlotte's question. There's a beautiful use of rewording, unwording, and scrambling of words we think we know into new and at the same time archaic ideas about religion and matter. How are these scholars and the both of you unwording as a mode of creating new narrative, new futures, and counter myths, i.e. ism? Yeah. And Alireza, you want to just ask your question and then Jay, you can figure out how you want to negotiate. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for such a um, rich and interesting talk. Um, I was uh, intrigued by uh, the way you um, were thinking about capitalism, and I, um, uh, you know, you you mentioned how matter was turned into use value, and I, I was intrigued by the fact that you didn't mention exchange value and kind of the mm -hmm. the duality of the commodity in terms of use and exchange. And um, I, I, I wonder if that's deliberate, but it, but it um, makes me think of your, um, some of the things you were saying about um, fetishization and, um, and uh, unrepresentability. I, I didn't quite get um, where you were going with the, the idea of the unrepresentable, but I, but I have a question that may, may get at that um, through, through thinking about exchange value. So if we think about um, uh, use value as a as a particular orientation to matter, right? Which is um, exploitative. It's um, uh, you know it's it's about making use of matter in, a, in an instrumental way. Um, exchange value. I think one way of thinking about it is in terms of the symbolic or in terms of um, you know an order of um, signification, right? So something mm -hmm. only has value in relation to other things, right? And it's and that value is determined by the market. So the market becomes the the system of uh, signification there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, you know, so what's happening, I think, through commodification is not just the transformation of everything into use, but also of it taking on a certain kind of symbolic signification through the market, right? Yeah. Um, so, th so then, so then the question is, um, I mean, I think one way that 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 um, sort of. Um, one way that kind of the, the the Christian reaction to fetishism, quote unquote, has been studied is um, in terms of new semiotic ideologies, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of Webb Keen's work, for instance, in mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia, right? I mean, he, he argues that the Protestants, Dutch Protestants, Calvinists, when they were um, engaging with animists, uh, so-called, in, in Indonesia, were essentially saying that they, they don't have the right attitude towards the relationship between things and words. Right, and then they were presenting a different kind of idea about how words and things should be related, mm -hmm. and Keen in, discusses these as two different kinds of semiotic ideologies. You have mm -hmm. an animist semiotic ideology, and then you have a you have a Christian Calvinist semiotic ideology. Um, but I it, I wonder if what you're saying is not so much that we're talking about a new kind of semiotic ideology, but that signification as such is something that is introduced through fetishization. Right, that before. You know the, the kind of thing that you're getting at maybe through this idea of the unrepresentable is that it's not about semiosis at all or it's not about signification as such at all and that's that's a particular mode in which religious studies also operates is looking for the meaning of symbols looking for things as symbolic and mm -hmm. as meaningful um so you know I, I don't know if that's what you were getting at but it, I, I think it would be an inter interesting argument and i wonder if it, it does form any part of your thinking um yeah thanks for that um both the question, but the way you you, you framed it and packaged it, um, I, I like how you you've done that in, in many respects. I need to I need to process it. Um, 
because it and, and it does in its own way tie to that first question about what what, what I'm doing with words, um, the kind of reshuffling of things. Da, da, da. Um, I actually do think those things connect. I'm going to try and answer the first question, or at least make a comment with respect to the first question that I think might at least have internal to it an implied response to you, which I would love to hear you, you know, kind of say, or even if we have to do it off off the, uh, the the Zoom, I really would love to hear your response. Because at the first level of wording, one of the things that I've learned and am continuing to learn in ever in new ways by reading a lot of poets, um, trying my hand also at poetry, um, I'm trying to improve at it, but nevertheless, just to, as a practitioner of it, but really through reading a lot of poets and seeing what's at stake and what the work that Mackie is doing as a poet, um, and any number of people that I'm reading and why I'm fascinated by poetry is because what I've learned through and come to really appreciate through a person like Mackie in particular is that um, words are not these stable things. <laughs> um, their very instability means or points to their internal fecundity. And it's the internal fecundity that I read um, Long is in one sense trying to tap or point to. I think the idea of a crawling back, I think that's what's at stake for him, right? Um, I, I know that for a person like Mackie and a number of other poets that I read, they're really invested in the kind of instability of words and how that instability destabilizes not just words, shows that words are, are unstable, but it destabilizes the very idea of a world, a so-called stable world because the relay between word and world, if that is like kind of creaking or to use a, a Mackie formulation, if there's a creaking of the word that's happening and he's drawing on Dogon mythology, interesting when he you know, unloads that formulation, I think that something like that is what I'm deeply, deeply interested in. And I think the way that you formulated your own kind of um, issue around, you're, you're, you're repackaging what you heard me saying around non-representability and uh, um, the system of signification itself and self in itself and somehow being broken or broken down, I do think I'm invested in that, I think. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm now just kind of like, re you know, responding off of your, your own intervention and using the first question as a, as a way to sort of think about it a little bit. Why, what, what, what is up with my investment in words? Why, why, title it um, the mater of myth, where matter and mater have a kind of indistinction, you know, they're, they're flowing through each other, both destabilizing each other or something like that. I think that's what's at stake for me. But I think that's, I mean, mm -hmm. no, that's a fantastic point, I think, to end on. Um, I wish we had so much more time. This is such a rich topic. Um, and uh, maybe if the students have other questions, would you mind if I let them send them to you? Because I have a feeling there's probably a lot to process given how incredibly on track this is for so much of what we've been doing in class. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for such an incredibly rich and powerful conversation. I'm sure it will resonate here for many weeks, months to come. So thank you so much. So join me in thanking our guests, Professor Carter and Hollywood. Thank you both. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah. Thank you, class, everybody. I appreciate it. Okay, see you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.